forge your inner armor. Welcome to the Inner Armor Podcast with Dr. Timothy Royer, where we explore ways to train our brains and bodies to become dynamically resilient so that we can all, from professional athletes to ordinary people, perform at our potential. Well, welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with Dr. Royer. Well, well, I, I'm not exactly here with Dr. Royer because once again, as always, Dr. Royer is on the road somewhere and he is calling in and we've merged in a call with another business leader because we are in a series called Business Brains where we're picking the brains of, uh, of fantastic business leaders and we're asking them how enhancing and strengthening their brains and autonomic nervous systems has helped them to become even better business leaders. And so today, Doc has got another leader that he's known for a long time. So Doc, first of all, where are you? And do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, that's a great question. Where am I? Well, I was in Minneapolis up for the Monday night game. I didn't go to the Monday night game, but Scott and I are the person that we're talking to today. We were texting back and forth uh, before that game. And I just got to let our listeners know, Scott says to me, the Vikings are going to be the 49ers. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And I said, there's no way. And he says, they're going to beat them by four points. And I don't know if anybody watched the game. Everybody watched the game. It was a great game. The Vikings not only won, but they won by five points. So this guy is like a Scott is a business leader, but he also knows football. So, and he also knows uh, how to beat the spread. So yeah, he does. So that was that was pretty impressive. But then from there, went home to Charlotte for a little bit. Now I'm out in Oklahoma with at Oklahoma State working with their men's golf team, women's golf team, tennis team, and softball team. So really enjoying it out here. Had a little break in the day that I wanted to just take some time to do this podcast for our listeners and introduce you to one of my dear friends and also a long-term client, Scott Weirda of CWD Real Estate. And I'll let Scott kind of tell his story a little bit, but Scott and I have worked for a long time together. And I think I've learned more from him than he's learned from me along the way. But I just wanted to give the listeners a delight of listening to Scott a little bit. And Scott, you want to just kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Thanks, Doc. Well, as you indicated, my name is Scott Weirda, and I have been in the uh, commercial real estate investment development business pretty much my entire career and all focused on West Michigan. And really, I've had a couple of different partnerships, but all within the investment field with shopping centers and office building and really try to be involved in the community and what we do is, inv is investing in our community. So I think that's, call it my background. I'm married and have three adult children now. So uh, we're similar to Doc. We're at the stages where we're, we're empty nesters and entering a new phase of our lives. So Scott, I know you, you've done a lot with these developments and it's been great for the community, how you leverage these larger retail spaces for people to come in and stuff. What is kind of like how you view that? I mean, you're not just building stuff. I mean, you're, you're like kind of like, it was a certain perspective that I think just comes out as we kind of look at what you've developed over West Michigan. I mean, what is your kind of your spec perspective on this development and the commercial real estate? Yeah, I've, I've always felt, and, and, and we're always a, a result of mentors and people that are around us. And I've just always had people that were similar to me and that they're passionate about about architecture and design. And I think the, what we try to put in each of ours is knowing that we have a responsibility of what we do. This is our community and we all have built environments. And I think when you, when you travel or you go anywhere, you'd be surprised how often you really are paying attention to architecture. Boy, that building's cool. I really like being there. Great place to hang out. Any of those things. I've always tried to focus on that and, and ask the why. Why does, some, why does somebody want to gather there? Why, why do we like this community? And, and I think I've just had a team around us and, and partners that have always shared that understanding that importance. 
And, and I think hopefully, hopefully that comes through with, with the developments that we do. Yeah, I can, I even see it on a, a micro level with just your own personal space or the space that you CWD is housed in Grand Rapids. I mean, it's got to be one of the coolest architecturally spaces. Can you tell, tell the listeners like where your, where your office is and what you've kind of done there? Yeah, it's uh, our office is in downtown Grand Rapids and we, we have a portfolio in the, in the urban core as well as shopping centers. We have a lot of office buildings, but we took, uh, one of the older buildings built in the late 1800s. And it was a space that was very difficult to lease. It was pretty interesting space. So the building was built by the, the Mason. So okay. the stone mas- stone masons built that and they created these spaces, as they call them, temples within buildings. And they're often, at the time, they were often hidden from a street level. So they were, they, they were just that. They had a temple effect and stage and, and tremendous woodworking and ceiling, ceiling details and things like that. But the space had fallen into disarray and it was uh, very difficult to probably lease to the typical office tenant or things like that. So my partners and I naturally said, do we own the building? Let's take the most difficult space for ourselves and to lease it, try to create something cool. So we, we looked at that as never wanting to try to mimic the history, but complement it and so let the history be what it is and and our space has some modernism twists and geometry inside that that i think complements what was there in a really interesting way yeah it is just fascinating it's a tour in and of itself to go to the cw space and you walk in this thing that was this temple slash church whatever up on the sixth floor like, what is this space? I mean, I never knew this thing existed in Grand Rapids. And what you guys have done, it's just, it does not feel like, not that Grand Rapids is low on the architectural chain, but it uh, definitely does not feel like you're in Grand Rapids. I mean, it's just, it's really pretty amazing. And we've lived in communities where you guys have built, brought in your development and what you do with the waterfalls and all the different things. It's just, it's really, really cool. You're just not, building space to build space. I mean, you're thinking community, legacy, all these kind of things, which is, is really, really cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We'll often say that, that design matters. And I see that on written on a whiteboard in my office. So when people come in, they're always just thinking that design matters. And, and that's uh, a mantra that we, we try to convey to the team to, to think a little different, to look at things differently. Yeah. And, and just look at our responsibility to what we do. And so far, so good. Yeah. And that probably is what makes you think beyond just doing business, but think about working on your brain that design does matter. How, how we are made, how we are designed really does matter. Before getting into that, though, what do you think like for to be successful in business? What are, what are some big things that somebody who's maybe just starting out or maybe struggling or thinking about how they're going to do stuff? What have been very essential for you over the years that just helped you be successful at what you do? Yeah, I, 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 that type of question is a good one, but it's always where we can get very cliche. Yeah, um, true. Very, very quickly. And, and so, so it's a little tough for me to answer that without being that, but I personally, and I know you've heard this with, with other people, but it's, it's never felt like work. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, passionate, very, very passionate about what I do, just like you are. Your passion for what you do comes through very, very quickly. And, and I think that probably starts with that. I think over time we, we develop our leadership abilities and we develop our skill sets, but I, I think it always starts with just this passion inside or the burning inside to do something that isn't just going through a daily routine. And for me, that's, I think, where is the, is the basic core. And, and, but I've also was, was married. I've been married 31 years. I, I have a, my absolute life's partner as, as my wife. And we both are on the same page and driven the same way and, and have a focus on family. And so we've always tried to, 
you know, that, that the business part's important and the things that we do, obviously that's putting food on the table and those various things, but, but really have always tried to focus on each other and family. Yes. And, 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 and as to be a, to be a driving base of what we do. And I, I can testify. I mean, I've known you over a decade and you're really good at what you do, but you're really good at family. I mean, both you and Rebecca and how you invest in your kids and stuff. And I mean, at the end of the day, what is, what is left? And it's important to be good at what we do and put our passion into that. But these relationships, right? And you, I've seen you live and breathe that, which is a really important and hard to balance in business. I bet was to like, you want to go hard, but you realize you got to balance this whole thing. And ultimately it pays dividends that you're you are creating that balance, right? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a doubt about that, that uh, if you're going to, it's not a sprint, right? And yes, so, so much what we do in life, we can get so busy and so caught up in everything and we all have choices to make, but the better we are at looking at the longer picture, really, really hard when you're young. Yeah. But you do realize that you're going to burn out and you need to have, you need to take care of yourself and you do need to, to, uh, well, as I've learned with you, a big part of it was learning to train your brain, not to segue into anything, but that's, that no, is, is part of what, what has helped that journey. Yeah. So let's, let's chat on that a little bit. I mean, I'm going to even need a little refresher on some of this because it's dating back a while, but how did, do you remember how you ever ended up, you and I interacting at that old office in Granville in yep. the old uh, building that we restored there? I think that was our first uh, meeting. Like, I mean, what was that? Probably 15 years ago? How long oh, did I think that was? My guess is it was probably, tw- am I, I'll make a tw- with the story. I would say, no, I'd say it's probably more like 12 or 13 years. 12 or 13. Okay. 12 yeah, or 13. Yeah. 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 So what, so how did that, how did our road, to refresh my memory, how did our roads kind of come together or cross? Like what, what led you to me? Yeah. Our, my children, of course. So the, oh, yeah. the, okay. the, the path was my youngest son, Hogan. Yeah. And he was, oh, I would say in that 10, 11 years old. And he was having some minor tics and things like that, that, that he was, that the pediatricians, we're very quick to talk about medication and ADHD and things like that. And, and it just didn't ever seem like that was the right answer to me. He was a very normal, wonderful little boy. And yeah, somebody had, I don't even know who, but somebody had mentioned there's this great guy you got to talk to, Dr. Tim Royer. And so I just reached out. That's we, we connected and, and I brought in Hogan and. He was a little uncertain what was going on. And that was an interesting time and for being a 10 year, 11 year old little boy. And, and so I just said, Hey, Hogan, this is, I've been hearing about this and we, it's about peak performance. Mention any of the other things. It, and let's, let's, let's work on this. And you love hockey and you love golf. Yeah. You're yeah. Really cool to, to focus your brain towards these sports. And, and he, of course, did need it. And I think when you, Spent some time with him. You very quickly said, "Hey, this does happen. These ticks do happen. It's electrical, and and it, he doesn't need the medication. He needs to train his yep. brain, and and we'll refocus him. And literally, these facial ticks and things like that that he had in less than a year were were gone. Unbelievable. Virtually. Yeah, unbelievable. And so, and so, in the meantime, I. I did what I said and I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll do this with you. Uh, <laughs> and started to, to realize I was having some benefits from it as well. And, and we've been going since. Man, now, now it's all coming back to me. Yeah. And I mean, Hal Hogan has done athletically and academically. I mean, just such a gifted guy as, as your, all your children are. And, um, and rewind, it's hard to even think back to then and how he applied himself. And then you, uh, it's kind of, we were just talking about the family thing before this is 
how you stepped in and said, well, wait a minute, I got a brain too. And why wouldn't I want my brain to be stronger? And that started that journey of us working on your brain. And what have you learned about your brain and your nervous system? And what are a couple of key things you think that you've learned in the last 12, 13 years in relation to yourself? Yeah. Yeah, quite a few things, actually. I think when you start training with you and met you, you had the approach of, of starting with the building blocks, le- learning the, the what and the, and the how. What are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to accomplish this? And I found that pretty interesting. But I do remember you kind of getting into the why, too. I mentioned that why earlier. I just, so much what we do is, is why do yeah. we do it? And, and, and I, and I did learn about high betas and thetas and, and blood pressure and calm focus and all those things. And, but, but the why kind of struck me is, is why did I even spend time doing this? And, and I think what I found is on my business, I, I do have to think fairly quickly on my feet. And you would, you described that as processing speed. Well, right. let me put anything to it, but just it, it, uh, whether I'm negotiating or there's public meetings or working with development things, you had to be able to think on your feet. And I think the, from a business perspective, that seemed to get enhanced. Right. combination of experience and those around us. But, but, but at the end of the day, you do need to be able to think clearly. And while well, I've listened to you with examples of saying an NFL quarterback has about two and a half seconds to look at three receivers and defensive sets and, and make all right. sorts of quick rapid decisions. I don't clearly don't have to do any of that, but, but I do have to process a lot of things quickly and, and make decisions just not in two and a half seconds. But I, I think I found that as, as something that was pretty noticeable to me. And then you were testing for it and seeing that as well. And, but the ability to, we all get worked up. We all have right things like that. But learning to breathe was, was a huge part of all hey, the, tra- yeah. the training with you and learned what cohesion was. Again, that's kind of the what and the how to get there. But all of a sudden you really did the why became, I am more calm and I am more comfortable and I am more relaxed. And I just think that helps you. Doesn't matter what you do, right? That's, I don't, right. I'm not sure there's a, a whole lot of, a whole lot of downside to that. Yeah. Like I remember us talking about like maybe you being in board me- meetings or in, in negotiations and things. And you would talk about starting your breathing. And everything's kind of getting frenetic around you, but feeling like you're seeing the seams on the ball, like by keeping the nervous system under control. It was really amazing kind of watching you apply that. Because back in those days, I mean, we were just starting off a lot of stuff and it was like, well, how is this going to apply to this or that? But hearing anecdotally from you, the clarity of thought and even some creativity at times, right? that you would talk about, which, which is really cool to see that. Yeah. Well, yeah. The S the SMR and that creativity, I think that's been an interesting one too. So you think you're spending your time the right way or balancing your time, right? You have a lot of decisions you got to make and yeah. you're just doing a lot of blocking and tackling, but in business, if you're not also spending time, letting your brain just go and, and be creative. But as again, as I've learned from you, we work on trying to get that creative creativity to be productive and, but isn't just in, in thoughts that aren't really going to lead to anything, but it's learning to, to think in a way of things that are actually going to be productive. And I've, I found that to be interesting and, and frankly, hugely beneficial. Yeah. The, the fact that, I mean, it's hard to, we think, I think in a, like an all off and on concept when it comes to the brain that it's either on or it's off. But this concept that it runs in all these different speeds, right? And what I see from a lot of people is they're running way faster than they need to as far as like, they like to call it multitasking, but kind of bouncing from one thing to another and never really accomplishing anything, which is this high beta number that we talk about where the yeah. fast ways are going fast. But you have over the years 
become an expert, and I use your brain as an example all the time, for how low the high beta can go. It's been quite remarkable to watch what you've done with your brain to get your, I mean, you are amongst all the different people I've worked with, I think probably the lowest in your high beta, which is for our listeners out there, high betas, the fast brain waves that are related to stress and ultimately can affect chronic illness in relation to our sensory motor rhythm brain waves, which are the calm, focused brain waves in, in whether it's sports, athletics, art, whatever it is, we need that high beta ratio to be really, really low so that we can use our creative skills. And what has that been like for you to watch that high beta go up and down over the years? Yeah. Yeah. Those are always in numbers of how you chart it. And, and frankly, I, I, some of the sessions with, during the training with some of your team in the past was fairly interesting to me because they every once in a while go, whoa, how does that even feel? I kind of laugh. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> uh, so nothing, I'm not doing really anything, but, but the training, I think you'd said originally below a one was a target and, and I was always kind of below a one. And I, I do recall that a fairly significant period of time was kind of in the point fives and point yeah. sixes. Yeah. And I remember one time sending you a point four seven or four eight and just, just crazy, kind of, just kind of laughed, but, but that wasn't normal. That was an outlier. So, but anyway, so I, but it does ebb and flow. It absolutely does ebb and flow. And I think the more I train, the more I would keep it down there. And, and so you're, you're reminding me that I probably need to up my, up my weekly times right now. But, but, but yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, you probably have to ask those around me. Hopefully it, it's made me better at what I do or a better husband and, and, and parent, but, but, but yeah. So let's, let's finish up on this topic. Cause we've talked about this a lot, the area of sleep. Okay. And I think a lot of business people that I interact with that they will tend to wear sleep deprivation as a badge of honor. Like, Hey, I got, I got four hours of sleep last night and I'm back in the office. Right. And everybody knows that they're, they're functioning off of four hours of sleep. And what have you learned? Maybe not just through us working, but in other ways, what is, what is your concept of sleep? What would you recommend to people out there in relation to like benefits or not of sleep and why that is important or not important? Yeah. I, I think that clearly was something I've learned over time. And, and you were part of that. But my wife and I, my wife is actually always a sleeper. I would, I would, I would watch the late news, watch the opening monologue on something and then go to bed. And she was always to bed early. And, and, and that was kind of silly to me at first. And what I, what I learned over time is that, that this, which I mentioned earlier is this isn't a sprint. You're not going to, you're, you just can't stay at a peak level for a long time if you're not getting li- literally eight, eight and a half, maybe even nine hours of sleep a night. And I know most people laugh and go, that's impossible. You can't do yeah, that. I know. Exactly. But, but my wife and I, and believe it or not, my kids are really good sleepers too. They, they, they've heard us talk about it enough. And we, so, so generally speaking, I, I'm asleep from 10 to six or 10 wow. to six, 15 every day day or most days, unless there's an event or special thing. So not perfect at it, but that is our, that is our target. And generally, yeah, that's, that's what we try to do. Anything that you would just say to the person that says, well, I just don't have time to sleep. I I, I can only, I only have enough time to sleep five hours, but and on a consistent basis, not just you got a deadline, but on a regular basis, would you any thoughts on that? Or? Well, I, I, I mean, I know lots of those people. So yeah, uh, <laughs> a, a, a significant amount of them. And, and I, you see it. I would say one of the, one of the curses in, in training with, with Doc Royer and in, in Royer Neuroscience is, is that you actually recognize a lot of things around with people that you talk uh, to. Yeah. Ooh, you need, you need, uh, you need your brain training. <laughs> Humorously, I'd say that, but. But sleep, I do know those people and, and they, they struggle to be consistent. 
And I think that's, it's not healthy, right? It's, no. but it is hard. I, I've got you no. know, kids, you're, everybody's got no. different circumstances and I know it's hard, but if people truly can learn to, to sleep, to breathe, they, they will find themselves in a much better position, at least from my experience. Yeah. We've been doing this, a lot of this work on looking at the epidemic of anxiety and depression and, yeah. and there's a lot of different ways to address that and look at that. And, but when you look at like breathing, sleeping and our gut health, you can knock out so many things in your life by just working on like the three basic things that are basically free to do anyway. Um, but it is very interesting, like, especially somebody like you, where, um, you just started to get in a routine of breathing really well, committed on your sleep. These aren't like, you didn't have to like fly across the country and go do a two week course on such and such. You just kind of got back to the basics and you haven't just done this for like six months. You've been doing this for, for years and how that's impacting the long haul on this, like you've mentioned a couple of times, has been pretty striking. Like you seem to have a ton left in the tank and are still moving and getting a lot of things done. And I just kind of wonder about those, those basic things. If we could get back to those things, how yeah, important they are. Yeah. Very, very clearly. So yeah. Yep. Well, Scott, it has been. Awesome talking to you and just, it's been great learning from you and your family. It's cool to see all the kids growing up and uh, yeah, it's been great. Any last words for our listeners as we kind of sign off? Well, I first and foremost, thank you. You've been a, a, a material person in my life over these last 12, 13 years. I've learned a lot from you and, and absolutely would. Not that this is a, an advertisement, but yeah, but ab- absolutely believe in what you do and who you are as a person and, and your wife, Amy and family. And, and so I, I do thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I thank you as well. Thank you for your time today, Scott. All right. Yep. Take care. Bye now. Well, what a fascinating conversation. If you've been enjoying these conversations with business leaders, you're going to want to learn more about the tools that they're using to gain an advantage in their world. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. Go to amazon.com and you can find our book, Forge Your Inner Armor. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook. Or you can go to our website, forgeinnerarmor.com, learn all about the program and leave us a message there. This has been the Inner Armor Podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Would you please follow or subscribe and make sure to leave us a review or comment. You can learn more about Inner Armor, Dr. Royer, and how to perform at your potential by going to forgeinnerarmor.com.